It's all a very technical issue. But if we read Blair's correspondence in 1938, in the context of the discussions on the issue which he raised on validity, and see how everyone was fixed, transfixed by this problem, I must say that, that, that I don't find Blair out of line. From today onwards with a passport, I become a Canadian national. I'm not a citizen, a Canadian citizen in the United States, that make any sense. I'm now a national, and there are basically two privileges that come with nationality. First of all, protection by Canadian representatives abroad, consular officials, and second of all, the most important one, the right to return to Canada. This, I think that he is just like the others. He is a prudent civil servant, and that uh, the Canadian government in this case, on this particular issue, is not better or worse than any other government. So I would like to end with now looking at Blair's response to the St. Louis crisis. The letters I've been looking at before were from 1938. There are some letters which, sadly enough, are not in the Draper Troper collection, but they are still in the unpublished in the National Archives, which basically follow the, as the St. Louis is steaming up from Havana to Miami and is looking for a harbor, basically the formation of, the, of a position of the Canadian government. It's very simple. Blair makes basically one observation, and he repeats it in various letters to Skelton, which is, it's blackmail. If we accept the ship, then basically the gates will be opened. And he says, the problem is not Germany. The problem is Poland and Romania. Early 1938, the Romanian government had announced that it wanted to see, to expel all of its 800,000 Jews. The Polish government was committed to expel at least, or to reduce its Jewish population with at least a million. There were three million Jews. And if you now start to look actually at the observations of Blair, that basically what we're dealing with is not the issue of the St. Louis and the passengers on the St. Louis, but it is basically about signaling the Polish and Romanian governments not to basically imitate the German government in creating such persecution that there is no future for the, for the Jewish population in their country. We see actually that Blair again reflects a broad consensus which exists all over the world, in every democratic country. We are engaged in blackmail. We're basically dealing with terrorists, and we cannot give in. Sad for the people on the ship, but they are in some way stuck in the middle. If we accept the ship, basically, we do not know where this is going to end. We will create and trigger the largest refugee crisis in world history. Now, the final question is, okay, it's all very legitimate. That is how basically politicians look at the situation, and they had right, they were right to look at it. But was there a way to in some way square the circle? And that's of course what the Dutch and the English governments did at the time. Simpson, um, the leader of the uh, Institute for International Affairs, said there is a way that we can find a way to negotiate both not negotiating not accepting these refugees, and nevertheless also saving them. Let's create international pool where these people can be housed and wait until immigration policies open themselves. By 1939, beginning of 1939, the English government was accepting the possibility that extraterritorial places would be created in Britain, and the Dutch did the same in Westerbork, in the province of Drenthe, in which Jewish refugees could wait up to 15 years, not being admitted to the countries of refuge, but also safe from persecution. In the case of Wurstenberg, of course, that proved to be an illusion. That, uh, in, in the British government, created the first of such camps in Kent, in Richborough, the Kitchener camp. The Dutch did it in Westerbork as a way to basically simultaneously signal to Romania and Poland and Germans, not to worsen the crisis, and at the same time also to accommodate the needs of the refugees. Um, 1939, the, uh, the camp, uh, the Richmond camp, 
uh, uh, was clicked really close after that because uh, you know it was clear that these, these were these refugees were then brought to other internment centers. 1940, Westerbork became an internment camp, and uh, can you conclude? And I am almost there. Um, so the question is, of course, that when Canada was confronted in 1940 with the request of the British government to take enemy aliens interned in Britain and house them in Canada, which it in the end did. It could have done so much more. If it had picked up on the British and Dutch in initiative to create de facto extraterritorial camps, knowing that there were tens of thousands of German Jewish refugees in France, in Vichy France, interned in camps there, I think that the Canadian government could have followed the example of the Dutch and the English and created such extraterritorial places of refuge in Canada, in some way both maintaining Canadian law and the principles of immigration on which ultimately its refugee policy was based, and at the same time giving shelter to the refugees. Thanks very much.